Before, before I get started, I just want to, you know, you know, I'm supposed to talk about the little strike and <laughs> those panels out there are just so great and I really want to, you know, applaud uh, the students who put them together did a wonderful job. I mean, it's a, it's, it's very, you know, very, very, very effective. Um, we saw the video of the Lawrence strike. And of course, what we're here talking about today reminds us that Lawrence is only, only part of the history of uh, New England textiles, only part of the history of the Merrimack Valley. Uh, in 1912 and 1913, uh, echoes of that Lawrence strike reverberated across New England, particularly in southern New England. A wave of strikes in Massachusetts, in Rhode Island, in Connecticut. Three workers killed um, in Clinton, in Ipswich, in a textile machinery strike in Hopedale. And of all of these strikes, the one that had the most impact on the area is the Lowell strike. Um, you know, uh, most impact after Lawrence uh, is the Lowell strike because that four-week strike and, law, and the, the, the lockout, the lockout that the workers successfully defeated, uh, results in ensuring that mill workers throughout New England, from Maine to Connecticut, will get at least a 10% pay increase. Uh, and I want to touch on three themes as you know, go through this. Uh, one is the solidarity and the activism and the mobilization of the workers. The second is the employer's response. And the third is community support. Uh, the 1912 Lowell strike grows out of the Lawrence strike. It grows out of the Lawrence settlement. It grows out of support work for the Lawrence strikers. The Lawrence strike captivates workers across New England uh, and beyond. And it also generates support activity. One of the important um, support centers is here in Lowell. And during February and March, uh, workers in Lowell hold meetings, they hold rallies, they uh, hold fundraisers. Uh, one fundraising event with 600 workers coming together in Lowell to support uh, demonstrate solidarity and raise funds for people in another mill town. Pretty impressive. And it's not just things that the Lowell workers are doing because they're getting support uh, from Lawrence as well. Uh, Portuguese, Lithuanian, Polish, Franco-Belgian uh, strikers from Lawrence are coming to Lowell. They're speaking at these meetings and they're talking with their compatriots. And this has an, this has an impact. We can see that solidarity really is a two-way street. Yes, the Lawrence workers obviously benefit from the fundraising that's being done on their behalf, but also the solidarity work is having an impact on Lowell. It's helping to uh, build a movement. It's getting people to uh, ask a little bit more seriously, what about my conditions? And then the next question is, and how am I going to improve them to get what I need and, and want? And um, it's also um, strengthening, revitalizing, well, not revitalizing, helping to build, to increase the membership of IWW Local 436, which has been in existence in Lowell for four or five years, but it's a, it's, you know, it's, it's a shell of an organization. And that starts to change in March. And the Lowell Cotton Manufacturers Association, the uh, organization of the big mills in Lowell, they see that happening, and they don't like it, and they try to put the lid on it. And uh, so they break ranks with the other Boston-based mill owners. They announce that they're <coughs> going to raise wages. But how much? And it becomes pretty clear they're talking 5%. And once the Lawrence mills settle for 5 to 15%, it's clear that that's going to be unacceptable. And if the Lowell Mills try to hold that increase to 5%, they're going to have a problem. And that's, uh, and that's what happens. Because on March 25th, uh, a committee of uh, IWW uh, weavers, Franco-Belgians, uh, the uh, Merrimack Manufacturing, go to management and they say, we want 15%. And uh, after, the, after that's rejected, they lead two to 300 weavers out of the Merrimack, and during the rest of the day, uh, the strike builds. It, it spreads through other departments at the Merrimack, and it starts to ripple through departments in other uh, mills as well. And that evening, there's 
uh, an enthusiastic mass meeting, which helps to uh, build the struggle, uh, helps to increase the momentum. But more importantly, there's organizing going on in the neighborhoods, in the tenement districts, door-to-door -door organizing, face-to-face -face organizing, uh, people talking to their co-workers, to their, to their neighbors, spreading the strike. And the next morning, there's large-scale picketing. Uh, right here at the boot mill, workers go through the gates, past the watchman. Just like any other day, they're off to the job. They get past the watchman. They pin don't be a scab ribbons on their clothes, and they lead other workers out of the mill yard onto the picket lines. Uh, and at that point, what do, the, what do the owners do? You know, the strike's starting to snowball. So they declare a lockout. And, uh, you know, they want to stop the momentum of the, of the strike. They close everything except for the finishing and the shipping departments, and they announce that don't come back until you're ready to work on our terms. And um, that's a familiar tactic. It's one that worked in Lowell in 1903. Uh, it's one, unfortunately, that works all too often today. But it didn't work in Lowell in 1912. I think there are three reasons. One, the most fundamental is the solidarity and the activism and mobilization of the workers. But we also have to consider the economy and the, uh, uh, what's going on in the other, other mill towns. Uh, and solidarity and mobilization is fundamental. Uh, there continue to be demonstrations uh, there continue to be parades. The workers aren't retreating in a silent test of will with the owners. Well, you know, you tell me to go home, I'll wait you out. No, there, uh, there are parades, 500, 1,000, 5,000 workers. Uh, there are rallies on the South Common. Uh, and there's also aggressive picketing. Uh, they are determined to try to close, to shut down, to stop production, to close the finishing and shipping departments. Uh, Whenever there's a rumor of a back-to-work movement, there's large-scale uh, large picketing. Uh, as in Lawrence, uh, women workers play an active role in these demonstrations, in the parades, and in the picketing. As in Lawrence, there is, uh, uh, the strike is really an ethnic coalition, particularly among the Southern and Eastern European workers. Uh, the Portuguese, the Lithuanians, uh, and the Poles are strong supporters of the IWW. Uh, the key to winning the strike is going to be the Greeks. And there is some support for the IWW uh, among the Greeks, uh, but not as, not as much. And the Greek work has turned to Dr. George Demopoulos, a respected community leader, and they ask him to lead their struggle. He says, yes, uh, yes, and here are three conditions. You don't pick it, uh, you don't join the IWW, you make me your representative uh, to the strike committee. And you, know, you need to understand that Dr. Demopoulos is a strong supporter of the strike. He's a strong supporter of ethnic cooperation. He realizes the need for solidarity and alliance, but he's also concerned about uh, the Greeks' reputation in Lawrence, and he's concerned that nothing, nothing be allowed to divide uh, the Greek community. Um, but he does, again, you know, insist on cooperation um, with, with, with the other groups. Now, besides solidarity mobilization, there's the economy. Uh, the, no, excuse me, 1912 is shaping up to be the best year in cotton goods uh, since 1907, and the low owners don't want to miss that. But the final piece, and which is related back to solidarity, is the response of the other mill owners, and that's crucial uh, because there's in the in the wake of the Lawrence struggle. There's uh, unrest throughout the, throughout the region, and uh, there's just been a bitter strike in Barry, Mass. There's a strike going on in Clinton, and now you've got this situation in Lowell with the parades and the picketing and that. And the, Lowell, the, the other owners realize that if they don't do something, that's going to come their way, and they don't want that. So they announce another pay increase, a second 5% increase, it'll be 10%, and that leaves the, the, the low mills with um, no option. They have to increase. And so they do announce a 10% increase. And how the workers respond is interesting, because some groups want to accept it, some want to hold out for the full 15%. And the IWW shows that it knows how to end a strike as well as how to run one. 
because uh, the activists, the organizers, uh, work with Dr. Demopoulos and others and insist that, yes, we want more than 10%. We need, we deserve more than 10%. But if we maintain our solidarity and accept 10% now and hold this organization together and build it stronger, we'll be able to get not only 10%, not only 15%, but more. We'll build a power on the job and in the mills. And that's what they do. Uh, they accept the 10%, but they don't just accept the owner's uh, offer because the owners have refused to meet with them. The workers insist that they're going to send a committee to each of the mills. Yeah. They want to know the exact amount, the precise pay schedules. They also want an overtime bonus. And most importantly, they want the mills to agree to recognize shop committees. They want uh, these committees as a way of institutionalizing uh, workers' power on the job every day. And so they send the committees around. And most of the mills, you know, they, they agree to terms, except the Hamilton Manufacturing Company. And there, the mill agent says, wait a minute. I'm not going to talk to any strikers. I'll talk to my own workers once they're back on the job making uh, cloth and profits for me. But I don't talk to strikers. And uh, at that point, Dr. Demopoulos uh, explains the facts of life to him. Uh, if, excuse me, if the Hamilton doesn't come to terms and uh, meet with the workers and agree to our conditions, then no mill in the, city of Lar in, in the city of Lowell will go back to work. And the Hamilton settles. And so on April 10th, there's a, a huge demonstration, 10,000 uh, marches in the streets led by kids with IWW pennants and, and, and sashes, uh, enthusiastic celebration. And of course, the question becomes, uh, what next? Unfortunately, over the next several months, the workers are unable to maintain that power on the job, uh, unable to maintain it uh, to a large extent because the mills insist that they are going to restore the old order. It's a much longer, much more complicated story that I can't get, can't get into now. It involves strikes. It involves Dr. Demopoulos leading uh, Greek workers into the IWW. But I guess just to, to wrap up, the fundamental thing, though, is not to allow this inability to uh, maintain a presence on the job to detract from the very real, the very important accomplishments of the Lowell workers dur during this strike. They demonstrated, uh, as Elizabeth Gurley Flynn said at the time, uh, that they looked, looked the owners straight in, the, straight in the face and told them that the conditions had to change. They also demonstrated as the workers in Lawrence had done uh, a month earlier. Uh, in the words of a banner presented to the Lawrence strikers at the end of the Lawrence strike, they demonstrated that, quote, in struggle, you gain your rights. Thanks. Put that history, that was great. We're going to put that history into context. Um, Ed Collins, I've known, I probably don't want to say how long because that's okay. We'll, you can we'll age each other. <laughs> but we've known each other a long time from back when I actually worked uh, at the American Box Company in Springfield. Ed was in the IBEW at the time, I was in the IUE. Uh, we worked together for a long time in Springfield trying to figure out how to put out of work machinists back to work. Um, Ed's been a backbone of the IBEW in, uh, in Massachusetts, in New England, a stalwart in the AFL-CIO. And for students, he's also been on the Board of Trustees of the University and an advocate for keeping UMass affordable for working class families. And so I'm really happy that you could be here to help us frame this discussion tonight. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Bob. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I guess my role here uh, is to uh, not so much make a presentation as try to facilitate a discussion, so it's, it's all of you that are on now, far more than I, uh, about what are the lessons um, of Lawrence and of Lowell in 1912 for our contemporary situation today. Um, so just a couple of words maybe uh, to try to set the, uh, the stage for 
for that discussion. I mean, there are some obvious parallels. Um, you know, within the past year, uh, largely in response to the things that Bob mentioned uh, at the very start of this uh, section of the program uh, about the growing economic inequality uh, and what many people seem to think um, is now more than a drift but a gallop uh, of our country uh, in the direction of becoming a plutocracy instead of, uh, instead of a democracy. And what we've witnessed in the last um, several months is a, is a spontaneous uprising against that in the form of the Occupy movement, uh, which in many ways uh, has some, some resonance with, uh, with the events that happened in, in Lawrence and Lowell in 1912. And in fact, uh, most of us, and in the uh, labor movement and the leadership ranks at any, any rate of the organized labor movement have watched this um, with um, some great hope. Um, and in fact, many of us have, uh, have looked at it uh, uh, as one of those um, moments that the poet uh, Seamus Heaney describes as um, that once in a lifetime long for tidal wave of justice that can rise up and hope in history rhyme. Uh, at the same time though, I think uh, we're struggling and um, stumbling uh, along uh, trying to figure out exactly how to relate to um, this spontaneous uprising that's, that's occurring around us. On the one hand, uh, what they have succeeded brilliantly in doing is riveting the public's attention on issues that the labor movement has been talking about to nobody who was listening for years and years and years, and they've managed to put those issues uh, front and center in, in the public's attention. And uh, now that the warm weather is on its way back, I suspect that, um, you know, that, that will, uh, there'll be a continuation of that. At the same time, I think many of the same uh, elements that uh, were involved in the Lawrence and particularly the Lowell strike that Dexter talked about uh, are, are um, you know, exist as well. And, that, and they have a lot to do with why the labor movement has yet to figure out exactly how to relate to the Occupy movement. Um, the, the, uh, his study and his, his excellent paper on how the Greek community in uh, Lowell responded to, to the matter, I think, really does sort of um, resonate with, with uh, the way the labor movement is trying to struggle with how they relate to the Occupy movement today in that, uh, and these are my words, uh, not Dexter's, but um, I think a lot of uh, the way the Greek community, and particularly Dr. Demopoulos, um, was responding to this was um, he knew the cause was just. He knew that only uh, in solidarity with the IWW and, and other groups was there uh, any chance of being uh, victorious uh, over the mill owners. But I think he was deeply concerned and, and, and afraid um, about too deep an entanglement with the IWW because he didn't want to take on uh, you know, the United States government, and, uh, and, and that's a fight that um, I think he rightfully thought, or history uh, in fact has shown, uh, that they could not win. The, the, for the, the IWW, um, which uh, all of us, I think, who are kind of labor history buffs uh, tend to romanticize a great deal, um, had success, and without the things that they did, a lot of other things that came after it could not have happened, but the, in the longer view of history, of course, uh, things like Lawrence and Lowell for them uh, were important, were stepping stones, were organizing tools, but were really only rehearsal uh, for what they saw as, as you know, the big strike when they didn't go back till they gave us the country. And uh, in the end, uh, as important as they are uh, to us then and now, um, they got about as far as uh, Atlanta and Leavenworth penitentiaries, and, and their movement, you know, did die out. Um, and so I think there's some great trepidation on the part of the more established labor movement about how exactly, uh, you know, you do relate to a spontaneous uh, uprising 
and, uh, and, and do it in a way that you can build something uh, much more enduring and meaningful out of. Um, that's, I don't have the answer to that question, but I suggest that it's a good starting point for, uh, for our discussion um, here today. So I'm probably going to stop with that, and uh, I you know, uh, would like to hear what some others' thoughts on, on the matter are, uh, or some other uh, ideas that folks may have about what some of the lessons of the Lawrence and Lowell strikes in 1912 uh, are for our contemporary situation today. So, you're on. Yes. Hi, um, I'm Sally Gould from the American Textile History Museum. And it's very interesting to me in sort of thinking about the bread and roses, the Lawrence, the Lowell strikes, thinking about the textile industry which has lost so much in terms of jobs disappearing overseas and thinking about labor and, and how we don't have a solidarity anymore, even though we're more of a global community because of the diversity of um, the communities all over the world, even though those workers are in a situation and, uh, that we were in and, and they are learning and yet we're sort of, we're pushing as a world <laughs> onto poor and poorer communities, difficult things that then have to be taught. I don't know that my question is in there, but sort of how do we take what we've learned and also work to help communities, not only in our own communities which are suffering, but also globally to have a better understanding of the worker condition? Yeah, well, it's a great question. I'm going <laughs> to, I, I wish I had the answer. Uh, I, I'm sure others might have some thoughts on it, um, but um, I, think, I think you're right. Increasingly, um, you know, uh, labor has to think more globally than we have uh, customarily done, and there are certainly some very small examples of where, uh, you know, uh, that is beginning to happen, but not anything like on the level that you're that you're um, talking about and raising. Um, I didn't mention also, uh, and I should have, um, that um, you know the other big parallel, at least in my mind, between what was uh, occurring in 1912 and what's occurring today. Uh, is the extent to which, uh, you know, looking at what we characterize today as the one percent, as uh, you know, versus the mill owners of, of 1912, are able to utilize uh, ethnic divisions to undermine uh, class solidarity, or or the 99 percent, as we refer, refer to it today, instead of the working class. But it's the same thing. We're just using very different terms, or slightly different terms. And of course, you know, I think. Um, that plays itself out today uh, very much in the form of uh, immigrants versus native born as it, as it did then. And the success that the strikers in Lawrence and Lowell had in overcoming um, the, those uh, ethnic divisions, um, as Dexter points out in his paper, uh, you, know, at a, you know, became one of the factors. In fact, De Dexter argues the dominant factor, maybe the single factor and why they were able to translate that into uh, an enduring uh, organization that was able to protect the gains that they, that they made. Um, so, you know, I don't want to get too far away from your question about uh, how, you, how it relates to, um, to the global struggle, uh, because we live in a global economy, but I think, uh, you know, I am much more concerned at the moment with how we um, try to replicate uh, the kind of solidarity that was uh, that was um, demonstrated in 1912, and learn from the lessons um, that perhaps Dexter might uh, add some more to the discussion on the lessons of the immediate period after 1912 and why they weren't able to hold it together. Yeah, it is a perception uh, that many Americans hope contrary to their own economic interests. I think it's more than perception. <laughs> I, it's a perception I certainly share, but um, I was wondering if you could weigh in on what you think the causes of that are. Yeah, um, we don't have enough time, but the, <laughs> the, 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 the causes are multiple. Certainly racial and uh, anti-immigrant feelings are a big part of it, but there's so many aspects, uh, more uh, dimensions to it. I mean. Um, you know, the old, uh, you know, 
uh, three G's, God's gays and guns that you heard so much about in, re in recent uh, uh, electoral politics, and I'll just focus on the guns aspect uh, of it from my own experience and that how easy it is to uh, divide, the, and this tends to be um, more serious in uh, certain uh, geographic areas of the country than others, but uh, typically in the more rural areas, uh, you know, that is the kind of a wedge issue that, that clearly, in some of our neighboring states immediately to our north, gets working class folks to vote against their own economic self-interest all the time. Um, one of the reasons that um, I am so excited about the Occupy movement um, and don't want it to become a missed opportunity, you know, to, to uh, address uh, the economic issues that they've, and, and the, and the uh, degeneration of our national politics in the way that they have, to, um, you know, those kind of uh, members of ours and, and people who are not in our ranks as members as well. The reason I'm so excited about it is I think at least for a moment people can, you know, take the focus off the, the wedge issues and see that, that bigger picture. Um, how you maintain that, I don't know, but, uh, but you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the, uh, the working class in this country um, has always been its own worst enemy, and there are moments when uh, they rise above that, and great progress at, at certain periods in our history have been made during those moments when they're able for, for um, uh, reasons, for a variety of reasons, to rise above that. And then we spend the next two generations well, seeing that uh, progress eroded um, a little bit at a time. Um, my own feeling is that I don't think that there's anything that any, uh, any person or small group of people uh, can do to um, sort of uh, bring those moments to birth. I think they, they happen. Uh, you know, the, the uh, great sin is if you squander them and don't take full advantage of them. And, um, you know, I think, you know, I, I have, as I've said a couple times tonight, I have the feeling that we are uh, in one of those moments now, and it's up to us what we do with it. Yeah. Yes? Well, it, it might be useful to look back and see how they got squandered before and uh, try to avoid those mistakes. I don't know myself. Yeah. Um, well, um, actually, I would like, because I won't do it justice, but I think I would like to ask Dexter to talk a little bit about that immediate uh, post-strike period and uh, Lowell. Actually, we um, I think we have a maybe a little bit of a disagreement on one point. It's the only thing in your paper that I um, I, I wasn't in complete accord with. Uh, your your um, my recollection is that your um, reasons felt that it had to do with uh, first of all um, the workers weren't able to get. Uh, formal recognition of any organization, and they weren't able to get um, <coughs> actual uh, written contracts. Um, and they relied primarily upon uh, ethnically based shop committees to try to enforce the gains that were made. And so the ability to, over, to, to create a, or overcome uh, ethnic tensions and divisions while the major battle was going on became a weakness later on. I, I, I don't know if I'm really doing that justice. I'd rather have you comment on it. But um, where I think I may be part company with you a little bit is um, that you really um, uh, are, I think, a little more dismissive than, than I would be about the role that the ideology of the IWW may have played in it, and that as a, a syndicalist organization, um, they, um, by their own ideology, I think, uh, had a, a powerful uh, aversion to entering into formal agreements and contracts with capitalists because they, they thought that in the long run, uh, they would, exp you know, that they would lose everything they gained, that, that really direct action over every grievance was uh, the way, and that certainly worked in the, in, in, in the big, in the main strike. The problem is, uh, and I think Dexter touches on this quite a bit, uh, the problem is that uh, when the grievance is not a widespread general grievance, but the grievance affects only one segment of the coalition, uh, getting everybody to go on strike from every mill in support of that grievance that affects only one part of the coalition or a small part of that one part of the coalition, or one person, 
basically uh, gets um, to be impossible and the thing begins to come unraveled. I don't know if I've done that justice or not. Well, but I think we, uh, you know, pretty much, pretty, pretty much, pretty much agreement. I guess the thing that I would say about the IWW ideology and aversion to uh, uh, to contracts, certainly the time contracts, is, you know, that's an issue that people talked about and could talk about, but I think that looking at a lot of tech, uh, not a lot, some of the contracts at the time, you know, yeah, in Fall River and um, maybe New Bedford, there were, you know, certain agreements, but they really, this wasn't something that was, you know, even if the IWW had decided that's what we want, that wasn't that wasn't that wasn't there. I mean, this right. this strike would have uh, right. the wall struggle. Um, oh, the mills weren't even talk refused to talk to them. Right. So I recognize. don't think that this was something that was really uh, on offer and, and and available. And I think that the uh, the shop committees were uh, again it's much more you know you say with a, more of a syndicalist. You know, viewpoint, but their attempt to provide some type of stable, ongoing uh, relations in the mills, and actually there were AFL contracts in, you know, in Manchester, which basically said management will recognize the union, <laughs> and that's all they said, yeah. clearly. And right. oh yeah, and by the way, there's no strikes and there's no arbitration, and there's, I mean, there's like very, very they're very spare. So um, uh, I mean, I think it's in a, in a point, but I'm not sure that. I guess I don't see that as re what really fragments thing, uh, but you know. Otherwise, Ed, you know, summer, some, summarize you know what I think happens in the uh, spring and summer uh, very well. That there are these the mills don't want a union there. Period. They don't want to deal with organized workers. Period. So when you know workers have a grievance, uh, the mills dare them to up the ante and. Sometimes you have um, uh, work groups or, or crafts, and there's a strike at, the, uh, at one of the mills where it's die house workers, which are, in this case, overwhelmingly Greek. And that spreads the strike. And actually, in that time, things did spread, but it's, it, you know, it's a strike that, OK, and now you're talking about reaching into your the same ethnic group in other mills. But it's really a, an issue that involves a small group of workers but it's mobilizing this, you know, these ethnic um, uh, 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 solidarities, and it's not around a, co a common issue. And that, that will happen later in the fall when things really, really fall apart. Uh, the Portuguese workers strike one mill, be they strike a weave room in one mill because uh, they, don't, they want to close shop. I mean, and mm -hmm. Elizabeth Flynn said, the IWW doesn't believe in a closed shop. And the workers say, "So what? <laughs> you know, you know, you, you want to work here? You're going to join the union." And uh, so management forces a strike, and this starts spreading throughout groups of Portuguese workers throughout Lawrence. Some other workers do join, but once the union says, "This isn't a fight that we want to take on," and I have no idea why they said that, it was a disastrous decision. Uh, it, it really fragments and. Um, <coughs> I think it has it has an impact on the, on the future because of the traumatizing effect of some of the folks who uh, got blacklisted. Uh, you know, the, the Portuguese branch really just gets shattered. Um, but I think that, you know, like it says, there are these. You know, how do you build um, how do you build so, you know maintain solidarity when you do have these ethnic uh, fissures that are uh, you can bring people together when there's a unifying issue, but when you don't have a unifying issue and you get these really Basic loyalties that are holding the community and the work the community and subgroups of the workforce together. It can be a, a, uh, an explosive situation which can cause either unity or fragmentation. Yes, Bob. I think I mean the larger one of the larger things that I think about with the strike is um, the the role the role first of all the role that women played in the strike and the way that. The image of women workers was shattered. Um, that a lot of the established union organizations, union organizers, did not think uh, women would 
organize themselves, would hold themselves together, the same way the mill owners thought in Lowell uh, in the 1830s and the, in the 1840s. And so that seems to me to be one takeaway, the, um, <coughs> to sort of defeat the notion that um, obviously an incredibly large and important part of the workforce um, can't be organized. That's foolishness. And the strike um, really showed and demonstrated that. So for one would hope that for all time, uh, labor organizers would get over that. The second sort of large lesson for me, other you know, not sort of the the fragmentation, but the moment where the moments where workers are able to overcome their language differences, religious differences, cultural differences to actually. Um, make a stand, I think those, for me, those are like the, um, I don't want to call them glorious takeaways, but heroic takeaways or um, powerful takeaways to think about for now, that if, if people who were desperately, desperately poor then um, didn't have a charge card, <laughs> you know, didn't have a bank account, had no possible way to make ends meet, yet were able to figure out those, how to get over those differences for 12 weeks, 14 weeks, then again in Lowell, then again in Fall River, New Bedford, Holyoke, this spreads um, to a great degree. That, that, that seems to me to be what this, one of the things that we have to try to focus on. Um, how, how, was, how was that done? Um, and again, I go back to something that, that um, I've learned the more I've researched and read about the strike that the really difficult living conditions, the plight of kids, I think really had a lot to do with people being able to set yeah. aside their differences because everybody knew somebody who had a baby who died. Everybody knew somebody who <coughs> died from some injury at work or some disease they got at work. Everybody knew somebody um, who was living in a tenement with no sunlight. And so I think those are the things that sort of created the unity and my, so for the Occupy movement and what you're saying about the Occupy movement, some of it for me has to be to figure out how the Occupy movement relates to that and to, because the way the Occupy movement has been portrayed, rightly or wrongly, and I'm not completely sure, is that it's a bunch of upstart um, hippie kids with money who are who have the luxury of being able to live in a tent at Post Office Square in Boston, or you know, in you know, at Zuccotti Park? And I don't. That's over. That, that's an over exaggeration. Yeah. But how do we get? How do we put those two things together? Because yeah. obviously, there's still this incredible. There's a, obviously a growing population of, of of poor people. The number. There's an article in the paper the other day about how many more people. Uh, exist these days on food stamps than, than ever before, yeah. um, things like that. So how do we, because, so my qu I guess within all of that there's a question which is do you see the Occupy movement in some way being able to reach across the aisle, so to speak, and relate to those issues, to, to those issues? I, uh, I do, and I, I, I think that, um, I, I think you're right in the public perception, or at least partially right in the public perception of the Occupy movement today, but um, I'm, uh, you and I, and we're not the only ones in the room, are old enough to remember how the, the view of the anti-war movement evolved over time from something very much like that to mm -hmm. something much more of a political force. I'm actually more concerned about something else. I, I'm more concerned about um, something that uh, I felt a resonance with the, the Lowell story um, and, and the response of the Greek community to the IWW. And that it is no surprise to me that the Occupy movement would become a magnet for the absolutely most marginalized in our society, that, that pe street people would gravitate to it. And the extent to which mainstream media has tried to portray the Occupy movement as some combination of what you described and, uh, and the dregs of society who everybody else ought to sort of be afraid to be associated with. So this whole idea of, uh, I don't want to get too close to this because somehow I want to maintain the respect and, uh, and, and the uh, uh, public standing in the community, if you will, uh, that might get compromised um, by too close an association with the Occupy movement. Now, I'm not concerned about that on, on, a, 
individual level. I'm concerned about that as being an impediment to uh, the more established labor movement to figuring out how do we relate to the Occupy movement. I don't think we've figured that out yet because I, I will tell you I have sat in uh, more than one meeting where uh, you know uh, a number of labor leaders have expressed what I thought was a very wrong idea about uh, we got to go down there and take that thing over so that it doesn't have this this image of being about well you couldn't do that if you wanted to in the first place and, and, and number two there couldn't be a quicker way to kill it than to try to get in front of uh, of a parade and say here we are your leaders and, uh, and and march in front of it so trying to figure out exactly uh, how we relate to and capitalize upon a, spi a spontaneous movement to reach goals that we share in common in a way that uh, ethnic communities in particular, the Greek community in, in, in Lowell, was able to successfully, at least for a time, do that in spite of their uh, reservation about becoming uh, too entangled with the IWW, who they saw as basically trying to lead the revolution instead of uh, advance the interest of a group of mill workers um, to win a strike. You know, it's a tricky stuff. Mm -hmm. you know? We got time for one more, and then we're going to have to maybe, maybe two, I see two hands, maybe two more. Okay. Actually, I just had a question because I was just wondering if there was anyone in the room who's been involved in the Occupy movement because I know a lot of our students actually were pretty involved in it, and I thought instead of hypothesizing about what <laughs> yeah, that would be it would be interesting <laughs> if anyone yep. actually has been involved in it, not for anyone was taught, but if anyone has been involved and is willing to kind of speak because I do know we have some students who've been involved in it. I don't know if I that, Here's your chance. Okay. I, 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 ha I haven't been, but um, you know, as a young unionist, uh, in you know, very in line with um, labor movement values, I actually felt somewhat, um, I guess, left out of the Occupy movement in some ways. Um, just as you were saying. Um, in terms of the labor movement, trying to find a, a position in in, term, in in the Occupy movement, I've I've found a perception from I guess occupiers, you would call them, um, that organized labor is somehow in 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 some way, and I guess in some way this is true. It has been true in in, in some examples that it's a mirror of the people that they're going up against, and that big labor is in some ways akin to, you know, the one percent in, in, to some degree. Um, now I know that it that's not true, um, um, mostly today, and and in some ways I've been kind of, uh, you know, put off by that from yeah. from the Occupy movement, and, and less like and more reluctant to. To join up, and I mean that was present in 1912 too. Yeah, very clearly that was present, and uh, because there were established unions that were even more distant from uh, the strikers, and and were held in uh, I think there was a certain amount of mutual contempt between. Yeah, so that was there then as well. Yeah. Uh, a comment and a, and a question, uh, or comment slash question. Um, on, the, on the matter of inter-ethnic solidarity that existed in 1912, at least as far as Lawrence, because I don't know that much about Lowell, um, we shouldn't exaggerate the extent of it and beat ourselves up over the lack of it today. Because the solidarity that existed in Lawrence in 1912 was primarily, not entirely, among the new immigrants who were this unskilled, uh, mass of workers in the textile industry. Um, in Lawrence, the Italians, the Lebanese, the Poles, and the Lithuanians. But uh, above that, quote unquote, were the older immigrants and, of course, the Yankees um, who didn't participate and looked down, and older immigrants, meaning the Irish, um, and to a lesser extent, French Canadians who didn't participate and looked down on this. So. You know, even then, there were issues about uh, uh, inter-ethnic and, and other, you know, uh, fault lines of uh, solidarity. Um, uh, 
that we have today with people who are unable to empathize with you know, Latino immigrants and others who are working in similar uh, conditions today. Um, a comment kind of going back to the issue of, uh, of uh, people voting against their self-interest uh, is the, uh, the idea that, uh, what is that idea? Oh, um, the perception uh, that so many people have uh, who are struggling, you know, they, they think they're middle class, but they're struggling and they don't know why, and they think, uh, you know, why aren't things getting better like they're always supposed to, and, they, and the mantra out there is, you know, taxes are, are what's killing me, when what people need is not a tax cut, what they need is a raise. Um, but, you know, wages have been stagnant for 30 years, or, or a better job with a better wage, but people just are, you know, uh, inundated with the, the message that the problem is government and taxes and not a fair distribution of wages. I think you're right. And increasingly, to go back to something that the gentleman uh, sitting right behind you uh, said earlier, increasingly they see uh, what's left of the organized labor movement as part of the problem because they be, because they have been in, able to do a little bit better job of hanging on to their piece of the economic pie during the during the last 30 years and therefore they're viewed as uh, sort of elitist and uh, and and you know that's a major part of that and a majority um, of whom are now public employees on the public payroll. yeah I'm not sure it's quite a majority but but it's a it's it's uh, certainly um, you know, the uh, part of the labor mo labor movement that gets the most attention, but it applies in the private sector too. I mean, uh, those of you who may have been around during the uh, prevailing wage fight, which now goes back to kind of the period of time when that video was made, early 1990s, the ballot question on prevailing wage, the way that the forces that were trying to repeal the Massachusetts prevailing wage and, and construction uh, uh, you know, laws in Massachusetts got their most success. They lost in the end, but the biggest traction they got was when they basically put up pictures of construction workers who had a, 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 a house at the Cape and said, look at this guy's house and he's got this house and he's got that and he's living high on the hog and I'm you're good. paying for that with your taxes, right? So uh, yeah, I mean, they're very good at that. One of the things to, you know, uh, try to come full circle with some of this is one of the things that has the promise. I, I, I certainly have no clue as to whether it actually is going to succeed in the end to, to cut through a lot of that though is um, the increasing perception that yeah I may be middle class but the middle class is sinking and so you know there's we're all sinking uh, you know it, it's no longer your end of the canoe is sinking and I don't care we're all sinking right. I think we've got to Sadly, and this has been a really great discussion. I want to thank the Sonia's Industrial History Center, Sheila, for allowing us to be here. Dexter, thank Ed. Once again, thank the students who worked on the Lowell Strike exhibit. There's now a permanent marker on the strike. Thank you all very much. Thanks, everybody, for being here on a Tuesday evening. It's been great.